uh, series of the Janet Das Sharma uh, seminar series, uh, conference series. Um, so the first talk will be given by uh, Professor Emmanuel Block from, uh, from, from Ludwig uh, Maximilian uh, University. Uh, I won't uh, waste uh, <laughs> his, uh, from say his uh, talk, take away time from it by, by a long introduction. And that's uh, he is the scientific director of, uh, or a scientific director at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics. And is uh, well, to men, pretty well known to most, most of you. So with that, I'll let Emmanuel uh, take it away. All right. Thanks a lot, Jay. And uh, thanks, Shanka, for the invitation to this uh, really great conference series. Yeah, let me jump in right away. This is a lot of experts here and uh, tell you what I want to talk about today. Uh, you see the slides changing, Jay, no? It's, did the slide change? Uh, yes. OK, yes, good. I always have to make sure. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. a problem. OK, so I want to briefly tell a little bit about uh, our optical lattice quantum simulators to so maybe also set the stage for what will be coming later. Also, what Marcus will be talking about, tell you about the simulation of strongly correlated materials and actually some very new experiments I want to talk about in the end. I hope you find them also exciting on uh, actually anomalous super diffusive transport, which is actually I learned a lot when I uh, talked about this. And I really think it's a quite exciting uh, topic, new topic, surprising topic on, on a model that has been decades course, long well known to everybody. So, um, okay, let me start right away and just saying my own interest in this field of quantum simulation really comes from the fundamental science point of view in trying to understand uh, these quantum many body systems in a better way. But of course, now there's become a lot of technological push in this that we might use it even to use it to design better materials. Well, I don't know, but we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. But certainly there's really this uh, unique opportunity to understand matter, quantum matter in, in better ways using these novel devices that we have at hand. And one reference model that uh, will be covered today, and I think also Marcus will talk about this, is of course the celebrated Hubbard model that you all know very well. And we like it uh, also from a quantum simulation point of view or quantum computing point of view, because I think actually it is the reference problem in material sciences for any quantum computer and quantum simulator. And if you want to compare uh, between different platforms, I think this is of course a great, great model to study and to, to check. And of course, there are still a lot of open physics questions to solve also in this model. So in this quantum simulation approach, we basically take the idea of implementing the model Hamiltonian directly in our system, letting it run, for example, for some dynamical evolution and then measure the system. And then from this outcome of the measurements, hopefully we can feed back uh, to, the, to the real system via, of course, theory. And theory is a very essential ingredient, of course, uh, via which this feedback loop, of course, works in the end. I also want to uh, connect this to uh, adiabatic quantum computing, because quantum simulation, when you do it in the form of starting with an initial state, an initial Hamiltonian, doing adiabatic changes to the Hamiltonian, you end up in a final Hamiltonian and hopefully in the ground state of that final Hamiltonian, then basically what you're doing is adiabatic quantum computing. So quantum simulation is adiabatic quantum computing, but in a basically restricted form. So for a adiabatic, truly universal adiabatic quantum computer, you would need to have control over all degrees of freedom in your system. And typically in a quantum simulation, you don't have that. You only have restricted form of uh, control over limited parameter sets. But uh, still, of course, the spirit is absolutely the same. So I would say in a more precise statement, uh, quantum simulations are a restricted form of universal uh, of adiabatic quantum computing. Then there's, of course, the question these days you can ask, is it good to use analog, these analog models that we're using or digital systems where you basically have gate operations and you can build up any Hamiltonian you want just from elementary dates that you have? Uh, when is it actually advantageous to use one or the other mode of operation of your system? Of course, here the problem is in the analog side is you have to be able to implement this model Hamiltonian. In the digital side, of course, you just have to have basic gate sets and you can build up any Hamiltonian you want to simulate, you want to calculate. But of course, the price you have to pay is the, the, the large amount of resources that you might need in terms of gates, in terms of qubits, the overhead, overhead is really uh, actually humongous in, in, that, in that sense. So here we did a simulation, I think, which was quite revealing together with Matthias Troyer, Andrew Daly and Peter Zoller to look, you know, how do these two modes of operation compare to each other? And we just looked at a dynamical evolution of a kind of small system with typical calibration sites on the analog side and compared that to what it would need on a, let's say, NISC 
quantum computer device today to do the same mode of operation. And we came up basically with these numbers that in order to do the same analog quantum simulation, you would need about 1 million gates uh, that you would have to carry out with this really very, very high fidelity that nobody has available today in the systems. Just showing, I think right now, uh, the point I want to make is that if you can implement, if you can do an analog quantum simulation of the model in your artificial quantum system, then I think right now we're still in an era where you're actually going to benefit from this analog mode of operation by far compared to a digital mode of operation. Okay, so now let me jump into our system. These are our optical lattices that we create by interfering laser beams. Here's a beautiful quasi-crystal structure that you see by interfering five laser beams. And we trap atoms in these uh, quasi-crystals or in these light fields by cooling them down to very low temperatures and studying their behavior in these, in these light crystals. And we can do this with a few hundreds to a few thousands of particles, as you will see actually in a second. And we can do this not only with spin systems, so qubits, uh, but we can do this directly with bosons, fermions, or mixtures between both. And I think that's a huge advantage for this platform because a lot of the problems we're interested in material science, of course, are fermionic problems, the ones of electrons and materials. And here we don't have to carry the overhead of mapping this fermionic problem onto a spin problem. We just directly use our natural fermionic qubits to do the calculation in the fermionic system. And yes, actually, I should just always mention that these beautiful pictures come from Ted Hench, and you can uh, go to his YouTube channel and uh, check out how these actually beautiful pictures were taken, how these optical interference patterns were done, and there are a couple of really beautiful other optics experiments there as well. So uh, the tools of trade that we use in our labs are these quantum gas microscopes, and they allow you to take basically snapshots of a many body quantum system. So of course, in general, we are dealing with density matrices, but just for the sake of the argument, let me just explain this in simple terms here in a pure state. So imagine you have a pure many body state, which would be a superposition of different configurations. And there are of course also amplitudes here with phase vectors uh, that we should also talk about. But in principle, what happens now if you have such a superposition state and take a photo of the system, with high resolution, single site resolution and single atom sensitivity is that this wave function collapses onto one specific configuration of your um, state. And this is the one you're actually going to see in that specific photo of the system. So you would see, for example, this configuration appear. Then you have to recreate Psi because you made a measurement. So after the measurement, you collapse onto this state. But now you have to recreate Psi, do the measurement again. You see another state. And then you do this thousands of times. And what you get at the end of the day is a probability distribution of configurations. And this probability from this probability distribution of configurations, you can then calculate interesting correlation functions that you want to study, do the physics that you're interested in. You can not only do this for occupations, you can also do this for currents. So in principle, you can also measure current current uh, kind of correlation functions in the system. So here's a picture of how this looks like. So you, you take, for example, make your lattice, you prepare a single two-dimensional quantum gas, you make an optical lattice there in the X and Y direction by interfering these laser beams, and then you uh, make the atoms fluoresce and uh, by shining a near resonant laser beam onto the atoms, and then you see them uh, light up. And that's the moment when the measurement happens and the wave function collapses. And then you suddenly see these bright spots. And each of these bright spots that you see here is basically a single atom uh, that you detect in your system. So we can also not only see these atoms, we can also control them. Here are some uh, measurements where we basically went in with laser beams and really in individual atoms, control them one by one, their spin state and flip their spin state. And we'll actually make use of this in later parts uh, of the talk, as you'll see. So this uh, control ability to show and control the spins in your system with a very good precision. Uh, you can also generate almost different kind of arbitrary potentials by realizing the light fields not by interfering laser beams, but by, for example, shining light of these digital mirror devices, where you can, for example, create different light patterns. And these different light patterns can then be used to, to trap the atoms. And I'll also come back to that. That's also a technique we actually use extensively, actually, in the lab these days. So this is how this works. For example, imagine uh, this is your pixel array of this micro mirror array. And each time a pixel is white, this mirror is tilted. Each time it's black, the mirror is not tilted. So this is the, how the mirrors would be arranged. You send a light beam onto this mirror array. And what you get out is this kind of light field 
configuration. This light field you can then superimpose, for example, with your optical lattice. And then you see now you've nicely structured your optical lattice and actually an array of um, actually quantum ladders. Uh, so you have uh, two 1D systems that can be connected to each other, separated from the next quantum ladder, separated from the next quantum ladder, separated from the next quantum ladder in the system. So this would be a single shot where you measure each atom in the system. And this would be, for example, the average density that we re record in the system. So by that you can use do extensive potential shaping and uh, I'll talk about that more. I think one thing that would be interesting at the end of the talk that it really has enabled us to go to much larger system sizes now. So here's a picture of a 2D system with about 2,500 atoms in this mod insulating state bosons. Uh, where if we push a bit harder on the cooling, we can uh, cool this down to very low entropy states uh, with about uh, also between one and 2000 atoms, uh, very much related to works also being done in Marcus group for the fermionic system. So we really also have large systems now available in box potentials, no harmonic traps, and this will be very important for the transport measurements I'll talk about at the, at the end of the talk. Huh? So we can really have these in beautifully, uh, very well controlled potentials in which we study the atom behavior. Okay, so let me turn to the first problem now, this uh, Fermi Hubbard model problem uh, of these interacting electrons in the, in the optical lattice potential. And of course, you are all very familiar with this uh, complicated phase diagram from the coup rates uh, that we try to get a better understanding of. And I'll, again, I'll come back to that. But if you ask me, you know, what is the essential question we can try to solve in our uh, fermionic quantum simulators? I think it's the competition between a uh, whole uh, delocalization and magnetic ordering that, that, that drives all these interesting phases that is at the core of, of uh, understanding all these uh, different phases. Huh? So the holes that want to delocalize and the antiferromagnetic ordering that we have on the other hand for these fermionic particles in the system. So here's actually a very nice experiment from Markus. Uh, you'll, I guess you'll talk more about that where he uh, showed how you could reach this antiferromagnetic phase in the 2D system in the undoped case. And uh, this is, for example, a fluorescence image of this experiment where you see the atoms again light up. And uh, if you don't do anything special, you cannot distinguish between spin up and down particles. So you see all the spins, ups and downs. And now by, for example, removing one spin component, uh, then you can actually become spin selective in your detection because now the only atoms that remain are spin up atoms. And when you now do a fluorescence image, now you can actually see this nice checkerboard pattern, which is of course symptomatic for your, your um, uh, antiferromagnetic uh, state that you have in your system. Now this works extremely well if you have no holes in the system, no doping, because you know every time there's a hole here, you know this must have been a spin down. You know if there was unit occupancy, every site was filled, uh, we're half filling. Uh, then if we remove one atom and we see a hole, that must have been a spin down particle. It becomes a bit more problematic when you increase the doping in the system, because then of course you don't know anymore whether the hole you're actually seeing here, is that a true hole? Is that a dopant hole? Or is that a spin down particle in your system? And so you need to, uh, and that's important because again, we want to look at this interplay of doping and magnetic structure that is present in the system to learn more about its behavior. So we devised a new method in 2020 that allowed us to do this 2D imaging uh, in a fully spin resolved way, spin and charge resolved way. And this is a cartoon picture of how this works. So imagine you have this two dimensional lattice here and this configuration of spin ups and downs, for example, in the system. So red would be a spin down, blue is spin up. Then you have some doubly occupied sites and some empty sites. And this is, let's say, the physical system. Okay, so this 2D plane is one configuration of the physical system. And now for detection, you do the following trick. So just for detection, you separate the two layers where the spin down particles you move up and the spin up particles you move down. So you've separated them in two layers. And now you can actually image those two layers uh, by just focusing with your objective, with your microscope lens onto either the lower layer or the upper layer taking two subsequent photos of these uh, upper and lower layers. So you now see the spin ups and the spin downs in the system and can then reconstruct the original configuration of your system that you had in the two dimensional physical system. Now, how does this work? So how, does it, how do we do this in practice? So it actually comes to our hand, actually a nice 
physics process again, namely topological uh, spin pumping in the system. And I want to explain how that actually works, how we separate spin ups and downs into two layers. So imagine you have one lattice side of one layer. Uh, so we have the 2D system and the lattice you're seeing here is along the Z direction now. And this would be one lattice side in the plane of our system. And it can be occupied with a spin up and down particle. Now, what you can do now is apply a magnetic gradient field and uh, introduce a super lattice potential, or we call it. So you introduce another optical lattice, which has exactly half the period of the original lattice. So basically, each lattice site is now split into two lattice sites. It's like a beam splitter. So you go from one mode, one side to two sides. But if we do this under the action of the magnetic gradient field and the two spins, remember, uh, have two opposing magnetic moments, then they will be separated into the two neighboring wells. So it's like doing a highly controlled stern galloff separation in our experiment to see those two spins, okay? So, and then in order that, that now you've separated the two spins, but they're still too close to each other. So you cannot see them because they're just now, the spacing is still too close to separate them in an image. So we have to do now, we have to increase the separation. And in order to increase the separation, we do a time, oh, sorry, and this I do, we do a time modulation of the subsequent potential like you see here. So we do now the Fowler's pumping and that allows us to separate the population of those different planes over larger distances. And once we've separated them over large distances, then we can take these subsequent photos of the two planes, okay? So here's a side picture that this works really nicely. So imagine you're looking a side view onto the atomic plane. So this would be a single layer of the atomic plane. And then we do this charge pumping and you see how these two layers are separated into two planes. One is occupied by the spun up atoms. One is occupied by the spin down atoms. And now you've separated them by almost 30 micrometers, which allows you to take these two separated images. So here are those images. Here's an image of the spin up atoms. Here's an image of the spin down atoms, which originally came from the same monolayer of the system. And now you can reconstruct the occupation in the lattice. You put the two together, and then you see the full occupation that you had in your lattice in the 2D system, okay? So now you really have a fully spin and density resolved image of the original Fermi Hubbard system uh, that you were measuring. Okay, and that's very nice because this will be the basis for everything that follows how we actually uh, measure these uh, spin and charge correlations in these systems. Uh, just to show you, we don't destroy uh, the spin correlations in the system by this process. The detection, of course, we have to do a good job experimentally that we really do this very well, that we don't destroy any kind of antiferromagnetic correlations. And you can see they're actually quite well preserved in this example that I show you here. Okay, let me turn to a first example uh, of physics that we can do, and that's uh, actually dynamical observation of spin charge separation, uh, which is basically a nice illustration how by you know, injecting uh, an electron or removing an electron from the system, one atom in our case, we can create these two quasi-particle excitations and really track them. Uh, you know, this all goes under the name of deconfinement of these two quasi-particles because now the two degrees of freedom, the charge and spin degrees of freedom have become liberated in this setting and can propagate freely. Whereas in free space, of course, they're bound to the original electron. Uh, the way, of course, how this works in a 1D spin chain is nicely illustrated in this cartoon picture. Imagine you have the 1D Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which for simplicity, I'm always sketching as this nail state, but of course you all know that this is just a cartoon picture of the Heisenberg state. Let's imagine we kick out an electron here at this time t equals zero. And then of course we will, we know that we've excited two quasi-particle excitations, the charge on the whole on here, which carries the charge degree of freedom and the spin on uh, spin one half here on the other side, which carries the spin one half degree of freedom in the system. And they Emmanuel, can- Emmanuel, this is Shankar. May I ask you a question which has bothered yes. Yes. So you, you have fermions in your experiment, the real uh, species, the real uh, uh, entity that you do experiment with is fermion. Yes. But, but do you really know that you're in an experimental setup, you have an effective Heisenberg model so that you can just talk about spins? I mean, this is a theoretical leap, right? I mean, going from fermions to spins. Experimentally, do you have any direct evidence that we can just talk about a spin model? 
Well, there's of course, well, we can, <laughs> I can show you several, yes, I mean, in this struggle, well, there are of course two approximations that go into this. One is of course that you have to ensure that you remain in the uh, spin subspace of your atoms. Typically the spins here are hyperfine states, uh, as you know, so we have to ensure that we remain, let's say in a spin one half subspace of the hyperfine manifold. This we typically do by applying magnetic fields, for example, to lift the degeneracy of the spin states. And then of course the Heisenberg model that emerges, of course, just, I mean, what we have is Fermi Hubbard model. And then, of course, the Heisenberg comes from strong interactions in the strongly interacting regime. And uh, we did a several control experiments to verify that you that you really have a Heisenberg model. Okay, good. That, that's what I was asking. So you do some control experiment. Yes. You just don't accept here. You just do some control experiment that you are actually have a Heisenberg model. That's yes. all I was asking. Okay. Yes. Yes, it will also become more relevant at the end of the talk because they are, of course, also deviations. And uh, but we can talk about these deviations also when they become relevant. Right, because it's, this is an important theoretical question. Okay, but you do experiment to check that Heisenberg model applies to the actual setup. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, yes, there are various checks we can do on that actually. A follow-up question on that: What is the uh, on-site excitation energy for these particles? You mean the U, the Hubbard U? Or not, not you, just the orbital excitation. Oh, the band excitation to the next energy band? Is that what you're meaning? Mm, yeah, I guess. So to the to let's say P bands, higher line P bands from let's say you start mm -hmm. with the S ground state in your harmonic oscillator and you go to the higher lying states. So this would be the vibrational splitting. Remember, you have these sinusoidal potentials, which I realized from the interference of the laser beams. Exactly. Okay. That's what I meant. Yes. Right. And there's, this is like a harmonic oscillator to first approximation. And typically these splittings uh, into higher orbitals are for our case, 10 times larger than the Hubbard U. Okay. So actually, yeah, okay. The Hubbard U actually is smaller. Okay. Yeah. In this case, in this case, not in all cases, in this case, we are pretty much in a single band Hubbard uh, uh, regime. Okay. okay. Great, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, yes, please, please continue yeah, asking. Since, since, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, is uh, do, do, is there a way? Since, so, probing a little bit deeper into this, uh, this uh, char characterizing the Heisenberg model. So, do you have an independent way of measuring J, um, yes. and comparing it to T squared over U? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. What we do, for example, we put a single spin. Let's let's take a ferromagnetic chain. Let's imagine we would be in a ferromagnet, and we have a ferromagnetic yeah. chain in the two components. Yeah. Both Hubbard model, let's say. Then what we can do, yeah. we can put a single spin in the center, and then we can uh -huh. watch how the quantum walk uh, of this single spin uh, uh -huh. in the chain. And from that, we can Excellent. calculate very, very well the J exchange, at least of the X Y part, Excellent. genetic energy part of right. this. Yeah. And uh, thereby, we, then we can compare that to T and U, which we can get from other uh -huh. measurements. I see. So, so you can even watch the dynamics, I guess. So you have time resolution. Absolutely, yes. I see. Yes, absolutely. On, on the level of J? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes, much, even much uh -huh. better on the level of J. Oh, I see. Excellent, excellent. Everything I show you will be full time resolution. Uh, this is actually easy for us. I should stress that. Keep in mind that yeah. Jake's change for us is about a kilohertz or a few hundred hertz. So everything oh, happens in millisecond time scales. So it's really, yeah. everything is slowed down in these systems and you can convenient. Exactly of the dynamics. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you now. We do exactly this experiment we're going to do. We're going to focus a laser beam onto one side. We're going to kick out one atom and we're going to track the evolution of the system, real time, the real space, okay? Okay, so here's what you see since you're asking. So is the whole density as a function of evolution time? So this is the lattice side, okay? We start at t equals zero, we kick out a particle. So the whole density here is close to one. We create a hole at that one side. And you see now how this hole does this quantum walk, just like a single atom on a lattice, single particle on a lattice. And you nicely see the interference structure and you see the cone. And from the cone, you can determine a propagation velocity. Okay. You can do the same thing now for the spin sector by monitoring the next neighbor spin correlations. We call that the C1 correlator of the SZ SZ spin correlations. You see, actually, it has a little bit, it doesn't show this nice pronounced interference structure, which is basically a reason because we're not at absolute 
to another t equals zero in the spin sector and the finite temperature uh, kind of reduces the quantum walk here in the spin sector, but you can still see a nice cone structure here. And if you can just, for example, now want to extract the propagation velocity of those quasi particles, the one associated with the spin and one associated with the hole, you can basically just look at the width of the distribution for the hole and the width of the distribution of the C1 as a function of evolution time. And you can already see it's nice linear slope, so you can extract velocities. And these velocities agree actually very well with the ones you would expect from the Hubbard model, just related the spin and charge sector by this T over U factor that you've been asking about before. And you can directly see here this whole quasi-particle excitation and the spin quasi-particle excitation. Now, actually, I want to show you that we can do much better to, to, to reveal fractionalization. And I here want to really highlight the importance of these higher order correlation functions that really allow us to see things that much better way than, than we could before. Because uh, fractionalization actually manifests itself much more directly uh, in this three-point correlator. So this three-point correlator is measuring the spins around a hole. So it's asking, how are these spins uh, uh, oriented if you have a hole in the middle? Okay, so uh, let's take this example again here. At time t equals zero, we kick out this particle, we create a hole. So at time t equals zero, then these two spins will be ferromagnetically aligned. Okay, this correlator will be ferromagnetic. But at a later point in time, when the spin on has been removed from the hole on, the spin environment around the hole will be anti correlated, will be anti ferromagnetically oriented. And that's a direct evidence of this fractionalization process of the spin on moving away from the hole on. Okay, so that's really a new quantity that we can look at and that we can only look at with these artificial quantum systems. And that's really nice. So here's how this looks at. So you start, for example, at t time t equals zero with this positive, positive spin hole spin correlator. It evolves over time into this negative value and then settles on this background value that you can see here and directly reflecting the, the spin on being shed from the hole on uh, this kind of um, separation this, uh, of the spin on from the hole on part in the system. Okay, and this you can only see in this three point correlator in the system. All right, uh, I actually want to connect this also to, to the hidden order that's present in the ground state of the system because that's maybe a feature of spin charge separation that is much less well known than the dynamical effects. And in order to understand that, I want to just again reiterate uh, what, what we're looking at. We're again looking at the competition between holes that want to minimize kinetic energy by delocalizing and spins that want to minimize energy by aligning antiferromagnetically in the fermionic chain. And if you ask now, what is the ground state actually for such a system when you have holes in a doped 1D system? Well, then the hole wants to delocalize. So it's a superposition of being everywhere in the chain. And around that hole, you will have an antiferromagnetic correlation. Okay, so that's the ground state for this 1D Fermi Hubbard chain. So each time there is a hole in the system, you basically have a domain wall, a soliton type domain wall, a topological defect or topological excitation in the system where the parity of the antiferromagnet to the left or to the right of this hole flips in sign by minus one. Okay. And so that's actually quite intriguing that in this 1D situation, the hole that is here present not only has a local effect, but it has this really extended effect over the entire size of the system. That's, of course, why, why it's a topological excitation for this 1D system. And here's actually an example that we can see this. So here's the ground state pictures of this doped uh, Fermi Hubbard chain. And let me walk you through this slowly. Again, I'm plotting the three point correlator spin, hole, spin. I'm correlating the spins on site zero with the spin on site D here, conditioned on having a hole at site S. Now this S can take two values. It can either be beyond D, so the hole is outside of the two spins I'm correlating, or the hole is between the two spins I'm correlating. And then remember when the hole was between, it flipped the parity of the corresponding um, antiferromagnetic ordering of the system. And this is what you can see here. So I'm plotting the distance of the two spins I'm correlating, on the vertical axis, I'm plotting the position of the hole. And now when S is larger than D, we're up here in this sector. And you can see we have, for example, this antiferromagnetic ordering down, up, down, up, down, up, down, so forth. 
But when now S is smaller than D, when you're in this configuration, now you see red has turned to blue and blue has turned to red. So the sign of the antiferromagnetic ordering has precisely flipped as I, as I showed you, as I explained to you. And now you can see this even better if you introduce this minus one to the D staggering factor in the system to reveal the parity of the corresponding antiferromagnetic sublattice regions. And you can see now this parity change directly reflected when you are between hole and beyond the hole in the system, okay? And now you can do this for even more holes. You have many more holes in the system, but each time now you understand the hole does the same thing. It flips the uh, parity of the corresponding antiferromagnetic ordering. And now if you stare at this image a bit closer, you actually see, well, then this 1D Heisenberg, uh, this 1D Fermi Hubbard antiferromagnet that we have there is nothing than a perfect Heisenberg antiferromagnet in a fictitious space, space called so-called squeezed space, where you have removed all the holes in the system. So remove all the defects, push the atoms together, and suddenly you see, oh, I have a nice, actually perfect Heisenberg uh, antiferromagnet in this fictitious lattice. And this is actually a precise result that was known from beta ansatz solutions early on, uh, here Wojnarowicz and uh, Ogata and Shiba in the 80s and 90s, which formulated this in the U infinity limit of the Hubbard model. You can have the many body wave function of the Fermi Hubbard model described as a product wave function of spinless fermions, which describe the position of the electrons on the lattice and the perfect Heisenberg antiferromagnet living on the positions of the atoms in the system. Okay, so this factorization of spin and density part in the system is spin charge separation in the ground state of the 1D Hubbard model. Okay, so it's not only a dynamical feature, it's really manifest in the ground state of the system. And of course, another way of revealing this uh, correlations, non-local correlations or this uh, hidden antiferromagnetic ordering is to, do, to introduce string correlators, which also can take into account of the parity flap that you get each time you cross one of those holes. So that both alternative ways of revealing this kind of hidden ordering. Um, okay, let me skip this. I just want to make a brief comment. We actually just we just have a new preprint out on the archive where we show that this also allows us to realize spin one, a topological Haldane phases, SPT phases, actually in uh, such Fermi Hubbard ladders. So if you have these Fermi Hubbard ladders and you terminate the system in the right well, right way, you choose the unit cell, for example, to be this diagonal unit cell, then these Fermi Hubbard um, systems are perfect realizations of uh, spin one Haldane SPT phases. And we can measure the edge states, see the spin one half located at the edges, and we can measure the corresponding string order parameters. And if you're interested in learning more about this, either talk to me later or, or um, refer you to this, to this archive publication. So I want to come back to our original problem of the 1D chain. Uh, and now I'm looking at a system where I dope the system between 20 and 80% holes in the system. And now I look at the system and I measure the two point correlation function uh, as a function of distance. And you can see this is basically always zero, except when the two spins sit right, right next to each other. Okay, if they're right next to each other, then of course they're antiferromagnetically aligned. Beyond that, because you have this arbitrary amount of holes in between the two spins and the two point correlation function will never show up any correlations. So you see this zero line. And if you just see this signal as an experimentalist, you of course say, well, there is no magnetic ordering in this system. Uh, there are no in more interesting magnetic correlations. But now I go to this squeeze space because we see all the holes and spins in the system. I go to this fictitious squeeze space and now you suddenly see how you see these antiferromagnetic correlations emerge again, how suddenly they become visible, something that was before hidden to you because you weren't aware of the holes. And now because you can see the holes, you can see this intricate magnetic ordering that you have in the system. All right, I want to move on from 1D to 2D, where of course things get much more interesting. Uh, uh, can I ask a question about the previous, sorry. Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah, so, so I'm curious, uh, so for this uh, squeeze space, you just literally remove the hole and do your measurement. And uh, when you do the measurement, I just want to make sure I understand, you just, uh, for each shot, you can have uh, some occupation number and use, you use that to extract the three point or two point correlation function, is that correct? Exactly, exactly. You either calculate your string correlator 
or you or you just remove the hole. If you found a hole, you remove it and you squeeze the system together as it would be a system without a hole, right? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I also have a question uh, leaving here. Yes. So, um, in the in the if you on the previous slide, yeah. Um, is the is the is the antiferromagnetic order across the hole is that uh, basically some some long range interaction there or is it in is it prepared first and then you introduce the hole and the hole starts to move around no, so this is not dynamically created so we really load the system to really realize the ground state of the system so we really create a system with doping uh, and we don't shoot out a particle like in the earlier experiment, the dynamical experiment I talked to you. So these are two different sides of doing the experiment. We can either take the undoped chain, kick out a particle, then you see the dynamical response that I showed to you, spin charge separation in the dynamical features. But here we did it differently. We really prepared the system with doping and cooled it as good as we can to the ground state. Okay, so in other words, Across the hole, there is still some remnant antiferromagnetic. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Because you, see it's, you you immediately see also why. Look at this spin. If it why why is this energetically favorable? Well, if this spin moves in here into the hole, if this just tunnels over here, then of course it would like to be antiferromagnetic aligned with this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I mean, so it's basically a higher order uh, spin exchange effect. Mm, I don't think it's higher order spin exchange. It's really just a direct when yes, okay. If you want it's T to the if you actually this holds true, even if there are many holes between this, even if there would be five holes between this, it would still be antiferromagnetically uh, oriented the next spin that comes. But then it's like a higher order, it has to jump five yeah. times, right? To, yeah, to exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we've yeah, we've seen yeah. that in the dots also. Yeah. Okay. Um maybe sorry, man. One one more quickly. So so this is actually so. So, so I guess this spin charge, the, the beta ansatz factorization, that seems to be an extremely strong uh, statement. Uh, and I don't know how much it's supposed to hold at finite temperature, but you're saying that if you do the, go to the squid space, then the core, and, and you just factorize out the boson part and the spin part, then the spin part should look like a Heisenberg correlator or it, it, it's correlation, all its correlation functions should look like a Heisenberg uh, model, kind of independent of doping, maybe up to to some renormalization of parameters. And the other, the superfluid part should look like a thermal Bose gas, I guess, because it's probably the, the BC temp or it, it temperature is kind of high compared to the hopping, effective hopping. So is there is there a way to check that? Like there's an independent yeah, of doping. Sure. What, what you're saying is absolutely correct. And I'm trying to just give a simple explanation. And then of course, quantitative uh -huh. features will matter, of course. As you say, as you correct, they say, for example, finite temperature will mean exactly what Lieben was mentioning, these higher order hopping processes. At some point, we will not have uh, uh, antiferromagnetic correlations across the whole. Actually, here's, here, here's, what we, here's actually exactly this plot, which shows you the number of holes we have between two sides. And you can see it nicely follows this antiferromagnetic ordering, but at some point we lose that because the temperature just becomes mm -hmm. too high compared to this coupling strength over this large distance. So, so of course, this this will matter at some point, but well, but also I would it's one D. It, it's also one D, so you don't expect long range antiferromagnetic. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, you this are always going to be at, at even at t equals zero algebraic decay. So right. exactly. If I speak of order, but let's say long range, let's talk about long range correlations. Yeah. In our right. case, these will always be enveloped by an exponential decay, of course, for the finite mm -hmm. temperature. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. but the qualitative the qualitative things remain the same. Mm -hmm. It's like then having a finite temperature. Yeah. Experiment. Okay. Thank so you. Have to actually, let me just quickly uh, in, in 2D show the results and then actually move on to the last part because I really want to show you the new stuff also. Uh, so in 2D, of course, the, the question of the single hole in a 2D antiferromagnet is a, is a longstanding question. And actually, I was super stoked to find this old paper from uh, Charlie Kane, Patrick Lee, and Nick Reed in 1989, which looked at precisely this Gedanken experiment. How does a single hole behave in a quantum antiferromagnet? You might think this is a simple thing, and but already that one is, you know, requires such great uh, theoretical physicists to, to to solve the to look at this problem. So okay, here of course the, the again we have competition between magnetic and kinetic energy, but of course now you also know that in two D the life is very different because in in two D a hole 
or a doublon in our case here moves, it leaves behind a string of uh, flip spins. So it has an energy penalty, which it does not have in the 1D case. So now in 2D, life is different. Now, instead of having this spin charge separation, you actually get a polaron, or in the case what Lieben is actually going to talk about, is actually also connected very nicely in the next talk of Lieben, you get Nagaoka ferromagnetism, that basically what happens here is around this impurity, you create a bubble of uh, reduced antiferromagnetic correlations, or maybe enhanced even ferromagnetic correlations, where the hole can move easily within that bubble, so it can minimize a little bit of kinetic energy, but you don't have enough to, you know, uh, to make this thing very, very, very large. So you have a polaron a, around this impurity, and uh, here are some pictures. I just want to flash these pictures because now we can really take real space pictures of this spin polaron around the impurity. So let me just explain what you're seeing. So we have dopants, mobile dopants in the system. We never know where they are. They're just doping, okay? Hole doping or double on doping. Here we have double on doping. And then we make a photo and we see the double on appear somewhere in the system. And then we see also the spins, how the spins are oriented, right? Because remember we have full spin and density resolution. We have full spin and charge resolution. And then I can create this correlation map where I plot, for example, the C1 correlator, the next neighbor spin correlator here, in the horizontal direction or the vertical direction, dependent on the position relative to the dopant, the mobile dopant. And you can see here already in the C1 horizontal and vertical um, correlators, how nicely you can see um, that uh, you have this distortion in the vicinity of the dopant of the magnetic background. This becomes even clearer in the diagonal correlators. So these are measurements of the diagonal spin correlators. Uh, which are positive here in the background, undoped antiferromagnet, and around the impurity, they actually change the sign, even they have a sign reversal of this dopant. Okay. So you really have the first real space pictures and uh, completely un unbiased, no analysis going to it. We're just measuring correlations, a fully unbiased uh, measurement, uh, a picture of these spin polarons that we have in the system. Uh, one thing we, we had just also worked on, I just made flash because this is interesting, is of course now what happens when you increase the number of dopings, dopings. I showed you that when you have weak doping, you get this spin polaron. For strong doping, we know actually the system goes over back into a Fermi liquid where the charge carriers are the fermions, the original electrons again in the high TC comp uh, compounds. And now we want to know what happens in between. And this is something we can really nicely do in our cold atom quantum simulators because we can continuously change the doping and we can continuously measure in, in very different quantities, um, polaron um, diagnostics, susceptibilities, measure the spin correlations around those. We can precisely pinpoint where this crossover from the polaronic metal to the Fermi metal actually happens, uh, Fermi liquid metal happens. And this is around between 20 and 30% doping. We find all those quantities to change even sign, for example, that allow us to pinpoint this uh, transition point from the polaronic metal to the Fermi liquid metal in the system. All right, in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about something new, <laughs> completely different. We're now into the realm of non-equilibrium physics a transport and this was actually uh, I really learned a lot and this was worked together with uh, the, the group of Norman Yao and Sarang uh, Gupala Krishnan uh, in, in the US on this and so maybe you've been following this more closely than I had but I think it's really a beautiful result coming back to the old Heisenberg model who would have thought that we still things to learn on the transport in the Heisenberg model I mean it's one of the oldest spin models we have so we just look at the standard Heisenberg model here, XXZ Heisenberg model. And we are now looking at transport in the infinite temperature regime. And what was very well established is that if you look at the function of the anisotropy of the spin model, if you're in the easy axis regime, you have diffusive spin transport. If you're in the easy plane antiferromagnet regime or ferromagnet, since we're at infinite temperature, it doesn't matter whether this shakes change is positive or negative, you have ballistic transport of magnetization. And then there was actually very recently, only in 2017, followed up in 2019 in the group of uh, Tomasz Prozhen in, in Slovenia, they found actually at the Heisenberg point, there's another form of transport. There's another form of universal transport uh, with this Kada, Kada Parang, Kada Parisi Zhang universality class with another uh, dynamical exponent of three halves 
corresponding to super diffusive transport in the system. And I think then only later, but all, all very recent stuff, as you can see here, there's been a better understanding where this special universal transport with the dynamical exponent three half comes from, from this generalized hydrodynamics, really showing us that it's a very subtle interplay of the integrability of the Heisenberg model together with the SU2 uh, symmetry, non-abelian SU2 symmetry we have in the unmagnetized case of the Heisenberg model right at this point. So only at this point, you have this new kind of transport phenomena with this KPZ universality class with this dynamical transport coefficient of three half. Okay, so um, the way how to measure that is to really look at the dynamics of domain walls, of spin domain walls in the system. So now we make use of our nice um, simulators in the system that we can have quite large systems now, uh, nice 1D systems. So we have several 14 1D chains here. They are like, and we can prepare, for example, the left half of the system in spin up state, the right half of the system in spin down. So you have a really perfect domain wall across just one lattice site uh, in the system. And then you can let the system evolve and you can blow away one of the spin components like Marcos did in the other experiment. And you can see how the um, majority spins on one side penetrate into the uh, region here where there are minority spins. So you have this constant motion of the spins from one side to the other side. Uh, so this is really all happening at unit filling. It's all within the Heisenberg model. It's all at unit filling. It's just the spins have been initially positioned in a non-equilibrium way. And now we want to do this not basically at uh, t equals zero for this pure domain wall, but we want to do this in a high temperature case. High temperature for us means that the initial state of this domain wall is has just less contrast, doesn't have 100% contrast, everything's been up to everything's been down, but basically the contrast given by this eta parameter for the density matrix describing the whole system. And with eta going to zero, that's really the physics we're interested in, okay? The infinite temperature physics, the infinite temperature transport properties of the system. And this is how, for example, pictures look like uh, of, of how such a system looks like. Now we can track these spin profiles and look at the polarization transfer as a function of time to extract the dynamical uh, exponent in the system. Uh, so we can measure just how many spins, average spin number of spins that have move from left to right and right to left, starting from this initial domain wall. This is what we call the polarization transfer as a function of exchange times in the system. So tau is one, one exchange time in the system. And this is the data, the green data point, green points here. And you can see actually, if we fit this, uh, we see very beautifully this three half dynamical exponent emerge that we expect from this KPC universality class for the super diffusive scaling. Uh, we also can compare this to ballistic, which would be this blue line here, or uh, diffusive transport, which would be uh, this, uh, this gray line here. And you can clearly see that it clearly deviates from, from either of those exponents and it's very nicely fits with, uh, with the expect expectation from the 1D regime. Now, I told you there are two things that go into this, integrability and non-abelian SU2 symmetry that are crucial. So let's check both, let's, let's remove both. So on the one hand, I can make the system go from 1D to 2D. That's easy for us, but very difficult now in numerics because now we just have to introduce the coupling between the 1D systems and do the same experiment that I showed you before and measure the polarization transfer and extract the dynamical exponent. And you indeed see as a function of the J2 over J1 coupling, as we go from 1D here to 2D here, we see nicely how we recover diffusion again for the 2D model. So because, of course, we're breaking integrability. We can also break the non-abelian uh, SU2 symmetry by magnetizing the system, okay? So here I'm plotting plots uh, of the polarization transfer of the spin transfer in the system. So this would be the 1D uh, system on the x-axis, time on the vertical axis. And you see how these spins start to propagate, diffuse into the other area uh, where there are minority spins. This is the unmagnetized case. And now I just magnetize the system. And now you see you get a completely different dynamics in the system. So the dynamical evolution of polarization transfer is completely different. Actually, if we look at now the polarization function as a 
polarization transfer as a function of time. It's pretty much linear in this longer time regime with a crossover here for shorter times entering into this linear regime that we have over here for, for ballistic propagation. So basically, we, 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 we're now at a stage where we can really um, look at these transport coefficients and compare to those, all those cases. So we have the 1D Heisenberg in the infinite temperature regime, unmagnetized. We nicely recover the three-half uh, dynamical exponent. We magnetize the system, and we see how we approach more and more the ballistic regime here with the dynamical exponent of 1. And on the other hand, we can break integrability and go to the 2D system and now see how we see nicely this um, transport exponent of, of two emerge in the system, showing all these three different classes of transport that we can realize in this regime. All right, I think that's what I wanted to say. I, uh, maybe where next we can, we can skip. We want to get larger, better control, make nicer potentials, but I should really thank the people who've been doing all the work with me uh, this was uh, Yanis for the Polaron mainly and Jaya for the spin charge separation. And um, the, for the recent experiment on the anomalous transport, this is basically may all uh, mainly David, David's work here, David Way's work uh, in this collaboration with the Berkeley team and, uh, and uh, Sarang Gopalakrishnan. All right, with that, I think I'm out of time and I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much. Uh, so, uh, is there time? Uh, so, there is a time for a few, couple of more questions. Um, uh, so, I've I've got a question. This is Bill. Of course, uh, Emmanuel. Bill. Um, yeah. So, um, the infinite temperature regime. Now, uh, what I'm wondering is, what does infinite temperature really mean in the experiments? That is, I presume that obviously it has to be higher than something, but I'm guessing it also has to be lower than something in order to still be part of the, the model. So could you say a little bit more about that? Yes. Hey, Bill. So, so infinite temperature would basically be a completely depolarized state. So where this, if you look at this density matrix, this eta would basically be zero. So there would be you know, no, just uh, equal amounts of spin ups and downs. The density matrix of the system is just unity. On the on all on, on the diagonals, right? So that would be if you look at the Boltzmann weight factors, that would correspond to equal Boltzmann weight factors. That would be the infinite temperature regime. So of course we can net, never work at infinite temperature because then the contrast of the domain wall would be zero. Uh, so we get close to this infinite temperature regime by making uh, the eta as small as we can. Uh, in our case, we typically work with 0.1 or 0.2 for this, and this means that this has just a finite contrast of this step function of the number of spin ups and spin downs to the left and right of this domain wall. How we do it in practice, actually, I can also explain. So we start, we do actually this pure domain wall, like you see here. And then we flip the spins into the horizontal plane with the pi over two pulse. And then we have local dephasings, uh, like local random magnetic fields that we apply to the system. And we let the system locally dephase and flip it back into the vertical direction. And by the amount of dephasing we can introduce, we can basically control um, how large or small we make this eta parameter here in the system. Yeah. So that's, that's how this works. Thanks. Um, are there any more? We still have a few more, more, more minutes. Um, I'll ask a question on if you yes. want to ask a question. This is really, Go on, Shankar. Uh, yeah, this is a more uh, not really directly on the talk, but trying to see where digital versus analog simulations would go in the whole quantum science because you know there's so much hype and claim that I certainly cannot keep anything straight. So, as you pointed out in the beginning, that what you are doing on a 10 by 10 lattice would require a large number of uh, qubits for digital simulation. Use a number a million. I, I, are you thinking about physical qubits? Because logical qubit, I guess you will need only about 100, right? Well, um, if they would be error corrected, sure. Yes, yes, of yeah, course. Okay, yeah, so, so one, one may even need a billion. We don't know. Since a logical qubit doesn't really exist, we don't really know how, exactly. many, how many physical qubits will be required. But even for your simulation analog, where you have very nice results, my question is to what extent could we have understood these results in depth if there was no theory at all? I mean, if we have to take help from theory and numerical work, we might as well not do any of this, right? So 
I, I'm just trying to normalize the hype outside. Analog simulation, as you showed, beautiful results can be obtained. But are you confident that if I have a totally different model where I do not really know the results, one can still make, make progress with this sort of analog simulation? It's a question, it's not a challenge. I'd really like to know your opinion. Yes, well, that's of course, I, I of course believe in that. That's why I'm doing it. I mean, of course, that's why I fully believe in that. I mean, I think we are at an interesting stage with these different models. For example, the Fermi Hubbard model. We're not so far away of looking at interesting phenomena where, for example, hole binding would occur where we can start to see pairing effects. We're also now it will get extremely challenging for Monte Carlo simulations, for example, to keep up uh, with the simulation results. Now you're asking two questions. So that's, I think, exciting that we're now basically at the brink of producing results, which, which, which basically are very hard to produce or impossible to produce right now and on the least classic numeric side. For sure, that's true in the dynamics. For, for example, this 2D evolution of this system, nobody can do this 2D dynamics uh, sort of evolution, what I showed you here. Uh, then there's the other question you ask is how much confidence do I have in the world, right? Yeah. That's an interesting, a very relevant question, of course. And I think then we can only, uh, right now, I think we can try to make consistency checks, try to lower temperature, see if scale system sizes and see if things are consistent. And in the end, I think then, of course, you know, comparison to some experiment will have to tell uh, some real material experiment, for example, would have to tell us whether that 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 is that that is correct. There, are, of course, ways how you can verify such quantum simulations, but usually they also require a lot of input that goes into the system. So I think we are trying to gain confidence on these well-controlled toy models. Let me put it like that. And by gaining confidence, we would be also more confident that results we get in less explored um, theoretical regime is also good. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. Let me ask you a quick, very specific question on that. Suppose you are working with the Hubbard model. You know, really you have created the Hubbard model in the laboratory. You know that because a large U regime where you basically know everything about the two-dimensional Hubbard model, things agree with, with the theory. Now, suppose yeah. you reduce U where Theory really cannot tell you whether even whether you have a MOT state or not. We know for large enough U, we definitely have a MOT antiferromagnet. Can you do experiments in smaller U regime and see what you get? Is that, you yeah. know? Well, yes, I think that's a good, you're making a good point, Shankar. I think we go to well-controlled reference points. Right. To understand the physics where we might even have analytical solutions. Yes. Uh, so we can be absolutely sure. Yes. And then we change parameters continuously Correct. in regimes where we are less confident. Right. Yeah, where we have theories, but the theory is, you know, approximate. We kind of believe it, but we don't know for sure. So for the Hubbard model, is it possible for your setup to do things systematically by varying you, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's what we do. So we vary this, uh, or we can vary this doping continuously. Or we, you know, we start out in a regime we know well, we end in a regime we know well, but the question is what goes on in the middle here. Right. Uh, what happens to this system? How does it actually? How do the micro? How does the properties of the system change on a microscopic scale uh, when you do this fundamental change from this polaronic metal to the Fermi liquid? And that—that's what we can do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Very right. very exciting talk. Thank you. Thanks, Santa. Sure. Awesome. So, okay. I think uh, yeah, we're at the eleven o'clock mark. Mark, so maybe we will uh, switch to, uh, yeah, Ignacio, can you start sharing your screen? Yep. Let's see. Oh, yeah, and, and thanks, Emmanuel, for the amazing talk. <laughs> Would that go without that? Yeah, sure. Um, so can you see, see my screen? Uh, yes, but uh, no, I see your whole computer screen. Okay, there you go, full screen, awesome. All right, so uh, the next talk will be uh, given by Ignacio Serac, also from Agar, from the Max Planck Institute, uh, well, I guess, yeah, for con from quantum optics. And this will now, we're switching to, to real simulation simulation as we understand it, theory simulations. <laughs> All right, Ignacio.
So uh, okay, so thank you very much, uh, Gay, and thank you very much, Anka, for this very kind invitation. It's a real privilege to be among uh, you, the people, the audience that you have, but also the speakers. And so when you sent your email asking for a talk, so you asked to address some points, which I'm trying to address in my talk here. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the research that we are doing, but also give some opinions and some views and related actually to the questions that you asked to Emmanuel and so on. So you, you will see, I mean, some of the things that I'm just mentioning here, are not very well thought through, but anyway, I think it's good to discuss these things at the moment. And indeed, so uh, there is a very big, uh, uh, let's say, hype at the moment on quantum computing. And in fact, we know very well that if we had a scalable quantum computer, we would be able to do uh, wonderful things with them. So actually, there are many by now problems that could get could benefit a lot from the presence of a quantum computer. However, we don't have a quantum computer. What we have in the labs at the moment are these uh, NISC devices, noise intermediate scale devices. These are digital devices based on quantum gates, also with some geometry, typically two-dimensional geometry that, are, uh, that have some errors. So they are not perfect. They are all also limited in sizes. And we also have analog quantum computers like the ones that, that Imano presented in the, in the previous talk. And uh, so let me start just making some statements. And uh, so I will discuss them a little bit, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about the research that we are doing in, in our group. Uh, so first is that uh, people are looking for application for these devices and uh, analog quantum simulators and even for scalable quantum computers. But I would claim that quantum simulation is probably the most suitable applications for quantum computers. That's really the place where we know that there is a big advantage and it's very hard to get uh, something like that with classical computers. So, I mean, I think that that's very clear to all of us, but I want just to, to remind you. The second point is related to what uh, Emmanuel mentioned. Uh, uh, before is that analog quantum computers for quantum simulations are better off than these devices. So they're much more efficient and probably will have results earlier than, than, than um, these devices. The third point that's not so much uh, appreciated is uh, why do we want a quantum simulator? In practice, why do we want to build these quantum simulators? And I want to argue that one of the main motivations for that it's not only to solve problems or to learn physics, but rather to benchmark and to develop theoretical tools that we don't have for many body systems. And also I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the main challenges to be addressed. Okay, so let me start with quantum many body problems. So all of us know that in systems like that, like the, peers, the ones that appear in chemistry and condensed matter physics or high energy physics, these are very difficult to solve with classical computers. In fact, in all these systems, we typically model them. So we discretize space, we discretize orbits, or we discretize whatever, we make a lattice out of them. We put some quantum particles in these lattices. In the simplest case, it would be spin one half particles or, or qubit. Then the, uh, let's say, uh, first principle of physics tell us what is the Hamiltonian that describes the systems, or maybe some phenomenological models give, tell us what is the Hamiltonian. And so the goal is to make predictions about these systems once we have this lattice and once we have the Hamiltonian. And we know that in order to make physical predictions, and we will probably have to compute uh, the wave functions or the quantum states of these systems. And we know that since the uh, Hilbert space dimension scales exponentially with the number uh, of the particles that we have or with the number of lattice sites that we have, then this is difficult. So in particular, so if we write the state from which we want to compute the properties as a linear superposition of all possible configurations, even with the simplest case in which we have qubits, then we need two to the power n coefficients and we will have to compute them. So this means that to start with, we need a memory that grows exponentially with the number of qubits that we have or with the volume of your system. But also, if we want to uh, compute these coefficients, we will have to do at least one computation for each of the coefficients, so we will need a time that grows exponentially with them. So we have a quite unique situation with quantum many body systems is that both memory and time grow exponentially with the number of qubits. So typically when people talk about solving optimization problems or some other classical problems, then there is not an exponential, uh, let's say, uh, 
uh, NIT of a, or, or, no, no, it's not a NIT of an ex, a memory that grows exponentially with n. It's typically like the time which grows exponentially n. But if we have a quantum many body problem that we want to solve, then we have both exponential in memory in time. In fact, so people have figured out that if you don't have access to an exponential a memory that grows exponentially with n, so imagine that you say, well, I don't want to have a memory that is grower, bigger than the number of atoms that we have in the earth or in the universe, and there is some, some limitation, then still you can see what is the overhead that you have to uh, pay in, in price. So you can then spend more time by using a, a memory that is, is maybe linear in N, only grows linear in N or is fixed. And then the time can be even super exponential in, in, the, in the size of your system. So again, this shows that, uh, I mean, quantum many body problems are especially difficult in, in, in classical computers. However, it was um, known for many years, known for many years, that if you had a quantum system and you can encode the state in your quantum system, then right away, then you need a memory that only grows linearly with n. So if you want to simulate the behavior of n qubits, then you will have a quantum computer with n qubits. You don't need two to the power n. Still the time may be linear or exponential, but you see that right away you have uh, again in memory. And this has consequences. And it shows that what I mentioned at the beginning, that quantum many body problems are really very special for quantum computers. And in particular, for these first generations of quantum computers, these are very difficult, uh, they are very difficult to simulate with classical systems. So that's a special, uh, there's a special place where uh, quantum computers can uh, gain advantage, even if they are not that big and the, if they are faulty. Okay, so the question, second question is what about analog versus digital uh, quantum computers? So we have now uh, many setups where you can do digital quantum computation and some of them where you can also have analog or develop analog quantum computers. And, and in, in both of them, you gain in memory because in both of them you're using quantum systems in order to state the quantum states. And so that's what I mentioned before that with n qubits, then you can simulate n qubits. So the memory, memory only grows linearly. And however, there are some there are some uh, uh, differences in some advantages. So, for example, let's look let's look at um, one of the simplest problems that you can address, or one of the most fundamental problems actually that you can address with your quantum computer, which is to compute the dynamics. So, somebody gives you some lattice with some geometry, some Hamiltonian with some interactions, local, for example, local interactions. Then it gives uh, this person gives you some initial state, which is easy to prepare, for example, a product state, and tells you to compute the expectation value of some observable with the evolved state up to some precision. Okay, so, so you want to know so how the physical properties will change with time, it gives you some initial state, the Hamiltonian, and then you have to compute the physical properties with a quantum computer. So it's known already for many years in uh, Seth Lloyd in his pioneering paper that uh, if you use a quantum computer, then the computational time will scale polynomially with the number of qubits that you have. So it will be like n square and would scale like t square where t is the time that you want to evolve your system. And will also uh, scale like one divided by epsilon square where epsilon is the error that you are allowed to have. And the uh, algorithm is, is very simple. So what it says is, okay, let me prepare my initial state in psi zero. Let me evolve according to the Hamiltonian. And then like, let's make my, I mean, let's perform some measurements. Let's repeat it many times. And at the end, let's compute the expectation value, the average of these numbers. And the only question is how to use a quantum computer in order to evolve the system and he proposed to use trotterization. So basically to take the time, split it in small uh, pieces. And if you have a small pieces, then it's very simple to translate this into gates. And this is where this number is coming from. So we see that already at this level, the to um, answer a question related to dynamics of many body systems, then with a quantum computer, it requires a memory that only grows linearly with the size of your system and a time that only grows quadratically with the number of qubits that you have. And classically, typically, this is exponential. So that's a typical exponential speed up that we get with classical, uh, with quantum computers with respect to classical computers. Actually, there are, in the meantime, there are much better algorithms. And so now I know the state of the art, the computational time with a quantum computer, scales like n, not n squared, scales like t, and the logarithm of one over the error. 
This is with uh, uh, digital quantum computers. You have an analog quantum computer that basically you don't have to do anything. You just have to uh, take your uh, Hamiltonian, tune the parameters in such a way that your system is, the interactions in your system are described by this problem Hamiltonian and then let it evolve. So that's it, relatively simple. However, if you want to do that, if you want to perform this with, uh, well, so the, the, what, what this shows is first that dynamics is especially suited for quantum computers, but it also shows that it's very natural for analog quantum computers. If you want to use a NISC device, then you will have to use this totalization. And this gives a huge overhead in the number of gates that you have to, to perform. So I think that Emmanuel mentioned some numbers, but that's really some numbers that you can get with the back of the envelope calculation in which you see that you really have a huge overhead because of this trotterization. So the gates that you, I mean, something that you will evolve for a time step in an analog quantum computer, you have to do many gates in order to approximate evolution. So this shows that actually in the basic, one of the basic problems that you can address with quantum computers where there is a quantum advantage, there is an advantage already for analog quantum simulation. Okay, there are disadvantages as well uh, of analog versus digital uh, quantum computers. So first analog, so typically it's not universal, so you don't have control over all possible parameters. There is no possibility of error correction. So errors will accumulate. And uh, the, from the uh, advantage is that it's easy, easier to build. But let me just mention uh, one, one question that, I mean, I think that it's, it's interesting to, to, to discuss. I mean, it's not that I have a very clear idea on that, but it's, it's so what happens with the errors in, in analog quantum simulation? So imagine that I have a Hamiltonian that I want to simulate. This is this uh, Hamiltonian here, and I have some error epsilon, and at each of my lattice size, then I'll have some error. So for example, if uh, Emmanuel has a laser and the laser is not perfect, then at each of the uh, sides, then there would be some error because the laser that is acting on the atoms is not perfect. And as you can see, this error is extensive in all these experiments. So this means that even if epsilon is a small, this um, uh, operator that is here has a typical value and norm that, is, that grows like N like the number of lattice sites. So you see that even if epsilon is very small, it's 1%, you have 100 lattice sites, then this can be very big. So this means that if you do any time evolution with the system and the, at the end, there will be some uh, 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 qubits that will be flipped and these errors will propagate and so on. So it, one would expect that then the, the, the error will not work and you will need something like fault tolerant quantum computation. In fact, you want to use this Hamiltonian in adiabatic quantum computation to factorize a number, this will not work precisely because of this, because of this problem. However, in some of the physical physics problems that we are interested in, we are interested in knowing uh, observables that are intensive. So you want to know what is the energy per, per lattice site or the energy per particle or the magnetization per lattice site or maybe two body correlations and so on. And so this means that when you compute these quantities, in many cases, actually, the error that you make is epsilon. It's not epsilon times n because you are divided by n. So that's something that is very qualitative because we know some models for which this can be justified, but that's not a, uh, let's say, a mathematical theorem that will tell you that. But this shows why this, uh, I mean, in quantum simulations, because of the observable that we are interested in, then the errors, I mean, don't matter so much as they would matter for, let's say, some other problems which are not quantum simulation. And I, I have talked about that already for, I mean, 15 years, especially to computer scientists. And I remember with Dori Taranov that, I mean, she could not, I mean, I could not, I could not prove that. And so she was very hesitant until I showed this picture. And then she was convinced this is the first experiment on quantum simulation that would could uh, um, in, in optical lattices that the, the famous experiment by Bloch, Eslinger, Greiner and Hench and some other people. And of course, they, they, they uh, simulated here a Hubbard model, a Bose Hubbard model. The Hamiltonian that they had had errors. And in fact, I mean, you look at what was the Hamiltonian and the errors that they had, it could, this epsilon could be something like a 10%. So this number was huge, it was much larger than one. But still, by changing the parameters, they were able to observe a clear distinction in a clear place in which the phase, the, the phase transition occurred. And of course, if you compare now with numerics, then you will see that the computations of expectation values, or maybe the position where the transition happened, then is, is accurate up to some percentage. But that's enough to clarify that there will be a phase in this model that is super, I mean, uh, super fluid and another one that is, that is not. 
as well. Okay, so the, the conclusion of that is for many body uh, problems, NISC, but especially analog quantum computers may provide useful Ignacio, information. Ignacio, yeah. I have a question. This is very interesting what you pointed out. It's, it's, I agree it's simple, but I didn't think about it. It's beautiful. So do we know though what the power law would be? I mean, I, I accept that with 10% error coming from laser, by doing things cleverly, you may have very little error in, in things of interest. But do we know how they depend on each other? Because if you don't, then we have a problem, right? No, 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 no. This is this is this is just uh, I mean uh, 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 an example based uh, uh, statement. Okay, so this is not that there is a formula that will tell you how much is the error. I would love to have that, but it's okay. difficult because, as you know, you cannot do perturbation theory here yeah, because okay. errors right. are extensive, and yeah. therefore you cannot just justify it with sure. perturbation theory. So you right. have to check, but but you could be lucky in many situations, and things that you really want may turn out to be almost either free. Very good point. Thank you. Yes, yes, and in fact, what you can do is take uh, free fermion, free fermions or free boson models, and then you can show these things. I mean, these uh, these things are very simple to show in those systems, but if you have interactions, it's not so clear. Okay, so let me let me go to uh, I mean raise another point. So why do we want uh, quantum simulation? So what can we gain in quantum simulation? Of course, one possibility would be is that we want to solve specific models. So we want to know whether in the Fermi Hubbard model at some uh, feeling factor there is a D-wave superconducting phase or not, and things like that. Um, I, I have the feeling that many of these questions has have been answered in the past by, by theory, and some of them will be answered by theory. So for example, I believe that Fermi Hubbard models, at least equilibrium properties, can be properly described with machine learning or tensor network methods, and they will be uh, learned, I mean, this will be discovered. And so, I, I mean, I think that it's, it's very useful, but maybe it's not the main goal of, of quantum simulation. I think it's more important to provide understanding. So you saw it in the, in the talk by Emmanuel now, I mean, things that typically theories have correlation functions and I mean, very uh, I mean, abstract language. Now you can see it in terms of holes and particles and atoms and so on. So this provides some understanding. It could also, uh, I mean, you can discover phenomena with that. Now you have a, a, a playground where to play with the system to change parameters. But what I think that is the, the, the most important, at least being a theorist for me, is that this provides a benchmark for theory. So we are developing in, in our group in many places some uh, theories uh, to describe many body systems. I mean, they work in certain situations, they don't work in certain situations, but we really lack of benchmarks. And so sometimes we have some predictions and there is no way that we can check them. And if we had uh, uh, and experiments and collaborations with experiments that I'm sure that we would develop much better theories than the ones that we would have now and eventually I mean, solve even some of the problems with, uh, with those theories just based on this, uh, let's say, ping pong with, uh, with experiments. So for me, the fact that we have the systems in which we can benchmark theories, I think that will give us a much better understanding and also possibility of developing theories as this has happened in the past. Whenever we have no experiments around, no ways to benchmark, then it was very difficult to develop these theories. And now they are present. Now there are many challenges as well. Of course, they're all experimental and technological challenges. I think that I mean, the results by uh, Marcus Lieven and uh, Emmanuel are, are fantastic and they're getting there, although they got there already in some particular cases, but there are many things to be done. Still there, uh, I think that there is a lot of room for new quantum algorithms for these analog quantum simulators now from a theoretical point of view that would go beyond uh, dynamics. And I will talk about some of them here. And also, you know, that there is this big hype about industrial applications of quantum computers. I don't see any realistic hope for the next few years, unless we can really find the problems in the industry where they will have to solve these kind of problems that we can simulate here. I have to ask you a question on this uh, yep. hype, okay, this industrial connection. Uh, and, and you are really the right person. Do you know any reason for this widespread belief throughout industry, at least that's what they say, that a quantum computer, now I'm talking about a digital quantum computer, somehow will do a more efficient optimization. I know of no theorem in computer science that says a quantum computer will optimize better than a classical computer. But you know, I'm not a computer scientist. No, no, but, but wait, okay. So if I had a quantum computer that is fault tolerant, that is scalable, mm -hmm. and uh, then there is, uh, there is a different scaling for some problems. So I can give you a three sub problem. I mean, the best 
algorithm is a quantum algorithm. So it's better than a classical algorithm. It there is not an exponential problem. speed up. It's a polynomial speed up, but still, I mean, that's useful. I see. For optimization, you are saying for, for optimization. optimization. Yeah, for optimization. There are several problems in optimization in which there is a, 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 a proven, well, not, it's not a proven. So you always compare the best classical algorithm and the best quantum algorithm. Right. And, and the I, best I, quantum I, algorithm is best better. Is it arising from the tunneling aspect of quantum mechanics? Because basically in optimization, you are doing some similar than annealing. Is it because in quantum mechanics, you can tunnel also? Is that what helps? Uh, well, that, I mean, you can see it in different ways, but the way in which, for example, this three sub problem is, is just a, a, a global algorithm. Okay. So you see the, the best, oh. I mean, many of these optimization algorithms are randomized oh. algorithms yes, and if you have superposition then you can accelerate them. So that's why it's like a power law enhancement. Exactly. Not, all right. exactly. Thank you. Thank exactly. you. That's my question. Exactly. Okay, so now for the rest of my talk, I want to... Uh, so was, Ignacio, this is Bill Phillips. Yep. Uh, so I'd just like to follow up on, on the question that, uh, that Shankar just, just asked about these applications. I recently attended a talk where somebody from D-Wave was claiming that um, for optim optimizing a problem that is very similar to a traveling salesman problem, that their D-Wave machines could outperform uh, classical computers by some uh, significant amount. And it, listening to it, I was extremely skeptical, but they're making these claims. I mean, the D-Wave machine isn't even a quantum computer. At best, it's an annealing machine, I think. And, uh, I'm just wondering whether you could make some comment about that in the same context as what what Shankar is asking. Um, well, I'm not an I'm not an expert, and I would, I, I would have to be careful with my um, answer here. But I would refer to a paper, recent paper by Matthias Troyer, uh, that a couple of months ago or one month ago that he posted in the in the archive, and this paper uh, has one statement, which is that when you have an optimization problem, this optimization problem is typically non-local. I mean, in the cities, it's not that you have nearest neighbor cities. So you have to translate this optimization problem into something that is local for the wave. And already in this translation, then you just lose a lot. Now, once you have this translation, then you have a local problem. I mean, some old papers by Matthias Troyer also showed that the uh, classical computation had a similar scaling as a quantum computer. And so that's why I would be hesitant, not knowing what uh, D-Wave has presented, I would be very hesitant. And I would uh, really like to compare really one of the problems that have, let's say, an optimization problem, traveling salesman, with all the overhead and everything else to see what is the scaling. And if I read the papers from Matthias, I would be, I would be very, I mean, I would, <laughs> it would be hard to believe that they have any advantage. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay, so now I want to talk about some, so I change a little bit uh, topic and I'll talk about some quantum algorithms first. And so going into this, uh, one of the challenges that I mentioned before. So now are the quantum algorithms, for uh, things that are not dynamic. So for example, for zero temperature or finite temperature properties of many body systems. And then if I have time, I will briefly talk about some applications in condensed matter, high energy physics and, and chemistry. Okay, so uh, let me first talk about zero temperature very briefly. So the problem it's again, the same. We have uh, some lattice model that somebody gives us with some Hamiltonian that describes uh, local interactions. And we want to talk about zero uh, temperature, namely properties of the ground state. So you now take your Hamiltonian and do you diagonalize, you will have the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this would be the corresponding energies. We are talking about the ground state. And so the goal is given a Hamiltonian and giving some observable to compute the expectation value in the ground state. And again, so you formulate it in the computer language, uh, uh, then you would say, well, up to some error epsilon, and we want to see how things scale with in the number of qubits and so on. And so this problem is very difficult and it's difficult even for quantum computers. So it was shown many years ago that this problem is QMA hard. So it's kind of the quantum version of NP. So these are exponentially difficult for uh, even for quantum computers. So the computational time would be like something like two to the power alpha n, even for a quantum computer. Uh, now, still, you, I mean, you could compare it now with a classical computer. And as I mentioned before, 
you want to compare with a classical computer, maybe you should treat classical and quantum on equal footing. And since the quantum computer is using a memory that only grows linearly with the number of qubits, then you should allow the classical computer's memory only to, to grow linearly with the number of qubits. And if you do that, then the computational time is much bigger. It's two to the n squared, it's two to the n to the power n. So this is super exponential. So already here you show, you see that the quantum computer offers some, some uh, advantage. So, but, and, and also here you see that there is an alpha. And uh, of course, if alpha was something like 0 0.00001, then this would be great because still, I mean, in practice, we could solve many models. If alpha is 100, then this would be very bad because we'll not solve, be able to solve anything in practice with a quantum computer. So now there have been papers on proposing quantum algorithms. And uh, for each of them, then you uh, see how, how is the alpha. And so we had a paper and some other people as well. And so for example, I would say that that's one, I mean, the, some of the best results is that this computational time to compute the ground state or the properties of a ground state with a quantum computer scales like two to the power n halves. And now there are some details. So it depends on the gap here. So this is if you have certain gap and it scales in this way in the, in the, in the error. However, these algorithms and many other algorithms are not applicable to NISC or analog quantum computers. So they require phase estimation and many other uh, uh, properties that would require too many gates. And this is not possible to do that, neither with analog nor NISC uh, quantum computers. So there are, however, some heuristic algorithms that have been proposed already many years ago in order to solve this kind of problem. So one of them is the adiabatic algorithm. And the idea there is that this is what Emmanuel was also mentioning in his talk. So the idea is that you want to prepare the ground state of some target Hamiltonian, because once you have this ground state, you can perform measurements and then compute these expectation values as was uh, uh, posed by the problem. And so what you could do is to start with some other Hamiltonian, which is trivial. So for example, which in which there are no interactions for which you know that the ground state is all, all the qubits are in the state zero. And now they form this Hamiltonian slowly into this final Hamiltonian. And if you have a belief on the adiabatic uh, theorem and there is no crossings and you do it sufficiently slow, then you will be able to reach this state psi zero. In general, uh, this adiabatic quantum algorithm for problems, let's say optimization problems where it has originally proposed, then it's not that good because these gaps in the middle get exponentially small. So in order to be adiabatic, you need a time that grows exponentially with the size of the system. However, for many body problems, so typically when we have transitions and translational invariant systems, then these gaps scale like one over n or one over n squared or something like that. So this means that this will work relatively well for many body problems as they appear in physics. That's why it's a very good, I think, a way of preparing ground state as it is currently done or for many years done in experiments. Another uh, method are variational algorithms. And in variational algorithms, uh, then the, uh, the idea is just to um, consider a quantum circuit. So a set of quantum gates that each of them depend on some parameter and then to minimize the energy of your system with respect to these parameters here, just by measuring the energy and changing the parameters. And the drawback of this variational algorithm is that they require many measurements. In fact, our experience in our group is that we have been working with them to solve many body problems. And at some point we gave up because they require too many measurements. And in order to get results that uh, would be uh, of uh, at, the, at, the, at the order of the, what you can get with classical computers required 10 to the 15, 10 to the 20 measurements. And so it was outrageous. For the adiabatic algorithm, also a little bit our experience is that for some of the problems that we have studied, it takes a little bit too long. So it still has this scaling, but it takes too long. And that's what, why we thought is, is there a way of combining the, both, uh, the, the, the best of both worlds to, to combine adiabatic with variational algorithms? And that's what we did here. And so the idea is to, now to take the adiabatic algorithm and to cut in different time scales in such a way that you spend the same time here as here, as here, and here, and here. So that in other words, that you go fast in some particular uh, 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 regimes or for some values of the parameters that you're changing. And in other places you go slower and faster and slower and faster and so on. And then you use these times as variational parameters. And so we have tried that, but before that, so what we did is what we call adiabatic spectroscopy in order to learn a little bit about 
So how these parameters are, what you could do is just to go forward, wait a little bit and go backwards and see whether you ended up in the initial state. So if everything was perfect, then you would have gone back to the initial state. So what we can do is to compute what is the probability that you go back to the initial state by different speeds and to, for example, fix that this probability has to be 90%. And then this will tell you what is the time that you have to take in order to reach each of these values. And then you can plot as a function, uh, as a function of this value, what is the time, in particular, the derivative of the time. And so what you see is that if you do the experiment, then you will get a very good idea about what, what is the gap. So it's related to the gap. And then you can use this information in order to easily find these parameters here, T1, variationally, and with uh, relatively few measurements, then you can accelerate the, the, uh, variation, the, the adiabatic algorithms. And that's an example. So this is for this Hamiltonian. That's a, a typical Hamiltonian that is a, is a good lab. It's a, um, uh, I think model with a longitudinal and transverse field. And what we saw basically is that you can get a tenfold uh, uh, a decrease of the adiabatic time just by using this, this, this method. So we think that this is very promising. And so we are collaborating actually with some people doing experiments on that to see these things in practice. Another thing that I wanted to mention about adiabatic algorithms is that in the, um, when people uh, talk about adiabatic algorithms, then they compute what is the computational time using this adiabatic theorem and computing uh, what, uh, so there are some formulas for that actually in this paper. So I mean, they showed, so what is the time it requires for an adiabatic algorithm in terms of the gap. However, in all these terms, they don't use locality, the fact that the Hamiltonian is local. And so in fact, so what some time ago, so we actually derive an adiabatic algorithm using the fact that we have uh, local interactions. And then we show that actually there is an, an acceleration with respect to the normal time. So in particular, it depends not on the time. It's not proportional to the number of qubits, but this depends on the logarithm of the number of qubits. So we believe that this could also accelerate uh, these adiabatic algorithms for many body problems. This uh, is, is, is uh, I mean, it's, it's an uh, algorithm which requires that you change the different parts of your Hamiltonian at different rates. And so it's a little bit complicated, but so we hope that people could, could try that in the, in the future. Okay, so this was about zero temperature. Now I'm going to talk about finite energies and finite temperatures. So the problem that uh, I want to address here is very similar to the one before. Somebody gives me an observable, gives me some Hamiltonian. And uh, now let's consider two kinds of problems. So one is that one fixes the energy here, and we like to compute, so what is the expectation value of this observable with states which have certain energy, maybe with some uh, uh, uncertainty in energy, or somebody gives me the temperature and I would like to compute so thermal properties. And so we have developing, we have been developing uh, quantum algorithms for those, for those problems. And so first of all, I have to tell you that this, are exponentially in general, because of course I can tell you compute at zero temperature. So if the temperature is zero, we are back to the problem that we had before. And I told you that this is QMA hard, or here, if I give you the energy of the ground state that I asked you to compute properties at, at this energy, then this would be like the one that we had before. So one would expect is that these problems become easy with a quantum computer, depending on the temperature. So at zero temperature, they're in general difficult. And then if you increase temperature, then at some point they will become easy. And of course, at infinite temperature, they're trivial because then you can, I mean, all the expectation values of poly observables are zero, for example, so you can do it by, by hand. And classically, the same thing happens. So there will be as a function of the temperature of the energy, then the problems will be difficult. And then at some point will be call, be, be, become uh, uh, easy. And so the question is whether there is some interval of energies or temperature in which the problems are still difficult with a classical computer, but easy with a quantum computer. And so that's what we want to address here. Algorithms that would work or that we, we promise that would work even in the cases where classical methods don't, don't work. And okay, so let me just um, mention one of the problems. So again, I'm fixing some energy and I would like to compute the physical properties and some given energies. But of course, this problem is not well formulated like that because the spectrum is discrete. So it may happen that the energy does not coincide with any energy eigenvalue. And so this is why you have to formulate a little bit more careful. 
And so you have to allow to have such certain widths. So the formulation could be the following. So you fix the energy density, the energy per particle. You give me some observable and you fix some variance delta and as well as some error epsilon. And then you would like to compute what is the expectation value of this observable with a state which has this mean energy and has a variance delta. And you would like to see how the computational time scales with n, epsilon, and delta. Right? So that's uh, to, to be a little more precise. And just to guide us in physics, so this is very abstract. So typical problems, so this delta, in order to get interesting physical results, so for example, that they converge to the microcanonical ensemble, then one has to take delta of the order of one or n. One has to scale delta also with n. There are several papers which, which did that. And so here, the goal would be to, I mean, again, solve this problem. So to take a state which has a width of the order of one over n and uh, to compute expectation values with that state. And so classically, classical algorithms, actually, uh, they, they, I mean, this is a difficult problem to find things that are in the spectrum, somewhere in the spectrum. And the basic idea is that the states in the middle of the spectrum has volume law entanglement. So for example, you want to, uh, solve them with uh, tensor network methods, then they will not work well. In fact, you can show this was what's shown in that paper that the entanglement uh, somehow grows like one over delta, and therefore the bond dimension in the tensor network will grow exponentially with one over delta. So the computational time of these problems then scale like in, in this form with tensor network algorithm, with classical tensor network algorithms. And so you take delta equal to one over n, which I told you before that it's the interesting physical regime. Then you see that the computational time for these methods grows exponentially with n. So this is a typical, I mean, problem at, even in one dimension for which the, the, at least the algorithms that people are using, they uh, don't scale well. And however, now this can be solved with a, with a quantum computer. And let's just me tell you qual qual qualitatively how this uh, algorithm will work. So the idea is first to prepare, if you can, a state which has an energy E. And this could be a product state. But of course, this state, if it's a product state, the variance of the state will be very large. So in fact, one can see that the variance of the state scales like the square root of n. So it's very, very large. It's, it's Right. So, so of course, you, if I have a product state that I compute any expectation value, it would be trivial. So this is why the second step, what you do is to apply a spectral filter like you would do in optics, just to filter in such a way that you make it much narrower in order to decrease the variance. And there will be a quantum algorithm related to that. And the third part, which is a little bit more technical, is that if you don't have, uh, let's say, a quantum computer, but you have an analog quantum computer, then it turns out that uh, this can be done just by doing some measurements, some other measurements, some auxiliary measurements. So you will never apply this filter. What you do is to do some other measurements with your analog quantum simulator, which involves dynamics. And from that, you will be able to extract the information. So let me just uh, give you a little bit of details of that. So first of all, of course, I told you that you will have to be able to first prepare a state with this energy, and that's indeed a restriction. And But I can talk a little bit more about this restriction. But anyway, so this cannot work. This I told you before cannot work for zero temperature because you should be able to, I mean, find the state that has the zero temperature or the zero on this ground state energy, and this will be difficult. And that's how I mean this is reflected here. You should be able to prepare a state which has this energy. The second, the spectral filter, it's just an operation that you apply to your initial state, which is a filter. So it's for example a Gaussian filter, and this Gaussian filter you can fully transform it, and then you see that it can be written as a sum of evolution operator. So this gives you the idea that the state that you want to create is a linear combination of the initial state evolved for different times. And so creating this superposition will be difficult with an analog quantum computer. And this is why you have the third step. And this is that if you realize that at the end, what you want to get is some expectation value, then what you can replace this in your formula of expectation value, and you can see that everything can be written in terms of these quantities A and B. So basically what this tells you is that you have to be able to measure is it start with the initial state evolve and compute what is the amplitude to end up in the same state you started. And if you compute this for different times, 
then you will be able to replace it in this formula and compute this all. And this is why this could be done with an analog quantum simulation, because you should be able to first prepare the initial state, then evolve, and then perform measurements, which will tell you whether you are in the initial state or you're not in the initial state. OK, so that's um, a little bit of a detail also that uh, that so that's the quantity that you want to measure so typically and so uh, for example you want to measure the absolute value this would be the probability that you end up in the initial state so that's related to the Lochschmidt echo and so this could be measured yes by starting with some initial state in your quantum simulator evolve for some time and then measuring the state of each of the spins and then checking whether they are in the same state or they are not in the same state now, you want to get the phase, and it turns out that for many problems, it's easy to compute this classically. And so therefore, you just need the absolute value. So you will have to measure for these particular problems, the Lochschmidt echo. And so now the claim is that you just use this algorithm that I mentioned before, that first prepare the state, then you do these evolutions, you measure, and then you plug everything back. Then the quantum algorithm, you can show that the computational time increases polynomially with n, one over delta and one over epsilon. And so this is, so you take delta equal one over n, then you see that this polynomial with n. So this means that this algorithm, there is an exponential speed up with respect to classical algorithm. So again, so I mentioned at the beginning that if you are interested in the dynamics of a system, then a quantum computer, a quantum simulator, an analog quantum simulator would be uh, very powerful as compared to classical uh, computers. And now what I'm seeing here is that also if you're interested in some uh, equilibrium properties like uh, related to microcanonical ensemble, this can also be used. And what you have to do at the end is to use the dynamical methods that you used before. So you do dynamics, you have to solve a ball for many times. And just by collecting the information after evolution of different time, then you can collect it in order to retrieve the spectral properties of your, of your system. The other problem is finite temperature. So this would correspond more to the canonical ensemble. The previous one would be related to the micro canonical ensemble. And so here, so the problem is very similar. So you're giving uh, some temperature, you're giving some observable, you're giving Hamiltonian, and then you would like to compute the expectation value with certain precision. And then you would like to know how does this uh, computational time scales with N. And so here, what uh, we uh, were able to, to do is to using very similar ideas to what uh, we showed you before, to give an algorithm, which actually is heuristic. However, it overcomes the sign problem in quantum Monte Carlo. So in other words, what this algorithm does is that uses the quantum computer or your analog quantum simulator as a subroutine of a classical computer. In the classical computer, you would do the normal Monte Carlo. But we know that when we do the normal quantum Monte Carlo in a classical computer for some problems, there is the sign problem. And the sign problem means that you cannot compute the probabilities for which you have to sample. And what you would do is to use this quantum computer with the algorithm similar to the one that I told you before in order to compute these probabilities. So this will be like a subroutine for your classical computer in which you can avoid the sign problem. So we believe that, I mean, this is, this, this is a very interesting uh, algorithm because somehow it convinces one of the main problems in, 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 in this quantum Monte Carlo method. Okay, so now I'm going to talk for the last 10 minutes about analog quantum simulators and about possible problems that they can be addressed with them. So now, so far, I was talking about algorithms. They were abstract. And I'm going to talk about some particular physical or chemic chemical problems in which you could use these quantum simulators. And I will concentrate on atoms in optical lattices. And in atoms in optical lattices, there have been proposals for solving problems in condensed matter physics, like hover models and spin models in high energy physics and quantum chemistry. And I want to talk a little bit about them, especially about high energy physics and quantum chemistry. The ones in condensed matter, I think that they are very advanced, even experimentally. You heard about them and you will hear about them today. And I want to concentrate a little bit more on the other two. So, uh, I mean, atoms in, in optical lattice has this nice feature that if you just write from first principle what happens at low energies when you load the lattice, then you come, uh, you arrive at the Hauer Hamiltonian. So, without basically, uh, let's say, no theoretical effort, then you have, you can simulate with them Hauer models. 
Now you have fermions that you can simulate Fermi Howard models. You have bosons, Bose Howard models. The fermions can have spins. You can have different lattice geometries. You can have work in different dimensions. So there is a lot of flexibility, and that's why. I mean, uh, most of the effort in quantum simulation is going to condensed metaphysics because you can simulate the, the models that I mentioned, like you saw in Emmanuel's talk and you will see in, in Levens and, and, and Marcus' talk later on. Okay, so what about high energies? Well, if for high energy physics, so typically when we put them on a lattice, then they are converted into what is called lattice key theories. And uh, so then they're I mean, some uh, ingredients that you need to add to that. So first is that in lattice gauge theory, so typically there is matter and uh, gauge fields. So the matter are fermions and the gauge fields are bosonic degrees of freedom. So you will have to have fermionic and bosonic degrees of freedom. On the other hand, these are relativistic theories. So one would expect that you will have to move your atoms at relativistic speeds. They are gauge invariant. And so this means that they have not only global symmetries, but they also have local symmetries. So they have many constraints. And another thing is that typically the lattice gauge theories are expressed in terms of a different language, in terms of Lagrange, Lagrangians and actions. And so here we like to have a Hamiltonian formulation, but none of that is a problem. And most of you know very well. So first of all, the fact that you need uh, matter and gauge fields, then the idea is that you will have to do your experiments using bosonics and fermionics, fermionic atoms. Uh, the fact that it's uh, relativistic, well, this is uh, solved by using a lattice because, you know, you have a lattice, then you look at the dispersion relation, then there is some regime in which is linear, you have a sign and some region is linear. So as long as the Fermi uh, energy is close to this part of the dispersion relation, then you will have a relativistic, let's say, uh, theory, effective uh, theory. So that's very natural in a way, very well known. The, way, uh, the, 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 the fact that they are gauge invariant then it turns out that these atoms have also some local conservation law. So when two atoms collide with each other, they conserve angular momentum. And so what you can use is this conservation law to encode the gauge, uh, uh, the, 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 the unitary uh, symmetries, the gauge symmetries of your model. So just by reinterpreting what are uh, symmetries that appear in atomic physics in, in lattice gauge theories, then there is a way of just transforming and then showing that you can simulate the systems and the Hamiltonian formulation that was solved many years ago by Kogut and Saskin, who showed that all these models in lattice gauge theories have a, a Hamiltonian formulation. And at the end, so what happens is that you have a, a lattice, like for example, in, in two dimensions, two plus one dimensions or two spatial dimensions in which the fermionic degrees of freedom are at the nodes of the lattice, the bosonic degrees of freedom are at the links of the lattice, and then your Hamiltonian would look very much like the Hamiltonians that we have in condensed metaphysics. So there is, there is um, some related to the matter, so to these degrees of freedoms, which is are acting on the on these uh, uh, vertices, on the fermions that are at these vertices. There is some Hamiltonian of the corresponding to the field, and so this is acting on the green particles. So this would be like the electric and magnetic energy you had QED. And then there is an interaction. So this means that basically when one fermion hops from one place to another, it has to interact with the boson degrees of freedom that is in the middle. So these Hamiltonians are very similar to the ones that appear in condensed metaphysics. And uh, the only thing is that you have to have some gauge symmetry. So typically there is some like a like in each of these crosses here, this, uh, there are some conditions, some symmetries that have to be fulfilled. And so what people have done is that, uh, I mean, look at how the symmetries can be encoded, as I mentioned before, in properties of the atoms. And in fact, I mean, there are many, many papers now which propose to simulate um, models of lattice gauge theories with cold atoms just by putting together fermions and, and bosons. And so here the challenge is going to more than one dimension because in dimensions higher than one, then you need four body interactions because the, 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 let's say the magnetic field energy then requires in this lattice formulation an interaction between four particles. However, these atoms have two body interaction. So you have to engineer out of two body interactions, four body interactions. And uh, there are two ways of doing that. One is using perturbation theory and going to fourth order. But this means that this will be very difficult in practice because you have to measure something that is a small in fourth order. And the other way is to do it in a uh, just by using ancillary particles which are interacting with these four particles and mediate, and they mediate 
the interaction. And that's some ideas that I mean, people like Peter Soler and ourselves came up with many, many years ago, but they have not been implemented experimentally. I want to mention something also that it's, uh, um, uh, that I think that is interesting is that sometimes people say, well, if we have an analog quantum simulator and we want to describe fermionic theories like in high energy physics, then we need to have fermions, right? So we need that our particles are fermions. And so for example, here you had superconducting qubits in order to do this quantum simulation or photons, then you would not, should not be able to do the simulation because these fermions that are here, if they are bosons, they will have very different properties. And we indeed know that in, um, in these models, uh, this, if you want to transform a Fermi Hamiltonian trivially into a bosonic Hamiltonian in more than one dimensions with the Jordan Wigner transformation, there will be string operators. You will have many non local operations which are very difficult to implement, if not impossible, with analog quantum simulators or even with uh, a digital quantum simulation. However, in, the, in this paper here with RSOR, we showed some time ago that actually there is a new, there is a unitary transformation that you can do in your Hamiltonian in which you can replace these fermions by hardcore bosons. So in fact, there is a unitary transformation which transforms a lattice cage theory problem with local interactions into one with local interactions in which there are hardcore bosons. And so probably this opens up the possibility of doing some of these quantum simulations also with some of the systems that don't have fermion fermions. Okay. And so finally, I want to briefly talk about quantum chemistry and the possibility of simulating uh, uh, with coal atoms in optical lattices, chemical um, problems. And so the idea and very fast is in chemistry. So typically one problem that people are interested in is what are the, 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 the equilibrium uh, configuration. So you put the nuclear at certain positions, and then you would like to know whether these are the equilibrium positions. So you treat in Born-Oppenheimer approximation, assuming that the nuclear have an infinite mass, then you solve the electronic problem. So you solve this Hamiltonian, find the ground state. Now you change the position of the nuclear, and then you plot as a function of the position. Here's the relative position of the nuclear. You will write what is the potential, the energy potential, and then the minimum of this potential will give you what are the equilibrium positions. So that's a typical problem that appears in quantum chemistry, namely that you fix the position of the nuclear and then you have to solve an electronic problem. And so we thought about how this could be done with atoms in, in optical lattices. And so for that, the first thing that you notice is that, I mean, you will need fermions. So because they will represent the electrons. And so the electrons on the one hand have to have some kinetic energy, but it's represented by the fact that they can move on a lattice. So if the lattice is large enough, then you can go to the continuum limit and then it would correspond to this part of your Hamiltonian. On top of that, then they have to be attracted by the nuclei, but this attraction, since the nuclei are not quantum particles have an infinite mass, this could be represented by a laser, so a laser that attracts the particle. And so we studied in detail, so how to create these lasers that would give rise to one over R potential using hologram, holographic uh, 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 configurations. And the most difficult part is how you uh, now get, how do you uh, have an interaction between the atoms that follows a Coulomb law? So how do you get two atoms which are neutral that interact with one over R uh, potential. And this seems to be uh, impossible because we know these are neutral atoms. Maybe you could assign them to Rydberg state, but then still the interactions are go like one over R cube or one over R six. And so that's not possible. So, but we, we found a way around it. It is to imitate nature. In nature, you have two electrons. The fact that they interact with a one over R potential is because if you write an electrodynamic in quantum electrodynamics, then both electrons are interacting with the electromagnetic field. And by exchange of photons, so it's an interaction with the electromagnetic field, you eliminate these degrees of freedom, the electromagnetic field, you get an effective potential, which is the Coulomb interaction. So here, what we figure out is that a way of using bosonic atoms that would mediate these interactions. And if you have the right configuration of the lattice, this would be a three-dimensional lattice, then you get one 
of these uh, interactions in this form. So we studied how very simple molecules could be simulated on this with these systems. It's rather complicated, but still we hope that the first experiments uh, uh, I mean, take place, maybe starting one dimension, then going to two dimension, maybe with something trivial like hydrogen atoms or hydrogen molecules and things like that. And then they can, they can, they can grow. So we hope that there are some experiments in the, in the future and we have collaborations with experimentalists in order to realize some of these ideas. Okay, so I'm finishing up here. So I'm coming back to my summary. And so quantum simulation is very suitable application of quantum computers. Analogs have uh, advantages with respect to NIST devices. Then one of the most relevant motivations for quantum simulation, at least for me, is benchmarking. There's still many challenges to be addressed. And let me finish with a picture of, this is my department. So we have a very big department with many people, especially there are many, many independent postdocs there. But the work that I was reporting here was done by Benjamin Schiffer, Cyril Lou, and Marie Carmen Banyuls then collaborate with people who were before in our groups and some of them have now positions in some other places and also some external collaborators. And so thank you for your attention. Well, thanks very much for a wonderful talk. Um, so time for some questions. We have, yeah, we have a couple of minutes. Um, hi, I, I, Ignacia, this is Bill Phillips again. I, about the, um, the quantum chemistry application where uh, you would try to simulate the one over R potential using bosons. It seems to me that since those bosons are massive, it would, at least naively, I would think it would lead to a Yukawa potential. So what's the deal there? Exactly. I mean, this gives you yeah, a, a Yukawa, but you can adjust the parameters in such a way that the core of the Yukawa is just one lattice site. Ah. And therefore, then you can have an effective one over R potential. Okay. Yep, but indeed, it gives you a Yukawa potential, exactly. Could I ask a question, uh, uh, Ignacio, on something you said that was very interesting, where you're combining uh, regular uh, tensor network simulation with uh, a quantum computer to handle the sign problem. I, I thought that was very clever. But that quantum computer <laughs> cannot be NISC. It has to be a fault-tolerant quantum computer, right? No, no. No, well, you see, so what will happen is like what I mentioned. So with this quantum computer, you will have to do dynamics basically. Okay, so you will have to compute dynamics and to measure things. And this will allow you to do the sampling with a classical computer. And now what will happen with an analog quantum simulation is that there will be some errors because in the dynamics, there are some errors. Okay. And so what we did is that we uh, and did some simulations now simulating the quantum computer with errors and that we saw that already with reasonable errors, 1% errors in measurements and things like that, you could still get uh, phase transitions and things like that with models that, of course, we know very well how they work because we had to simulate them with up to 100 uh, qubits. So I believe that it should be possible to, uh, to do that with analog quantum computers with non-fault tolerant. Now with these devices, then it's also possible to do that. However, you have to pay the price that I was mentioning and Imaru also mentioned at the beginning that in order to do the, 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 the simulation, then there is a lot of cost, a, a big cost in terms of, of gates. And so the idea there is, I mean, this we are collaborating with, with, with uh, some partners on that actually that they are trying is to simulate not a Hamiltonian, but a Floquet system. And therefore such that you don't, I mean, you want to simulate already something that has gates. And, uh, and in this way, you can overcome that problem. But uh, so I believe that you will be able, of course, it will not be precise, but you will get precision that is good enough to uh, answer physics questions that we cannot answer with. Yeah, I with, think it's, uh, a, it's a magnificent idea. I mean, I, I think it's one of the few ideas I think that can be tried now and could give us results that we cannot get with either completely, right? I mean, because the classical simulation can be done very well. And you are just getting the piece of information. I, I really like this idea. So you, you, there will be more activity on it. You, you are following up, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we are we are collaborating with uh, with some experimental groups that have quantum computers, and we are trying to to do that in the quantum computer. All right. Thank happens. you very much. Yeah, very exciting. Thanks. I had a quick question about the variational analog simulator that you mentioned. I was wondering about the connection to QAOA. What the differences are. Well, in, in QAOA, you have a, a, a Hamiltonian that is constant, 
and then you have a, con a, a fixed time. So what we do is that we change the profile. So we ramp the Hamiltonian, we change the Hamiltonian as a function of time. Mm -hmm. You see, it's not that we are at a, a ball with the Hamiltonian for a certain time, then for some other certain time, but for another certain time, but we do the adiabatic evolution. So we change the Hamiltonian as a function of time. And the thing that is variational is the rate at which we change it. I see, I see, thanks. Is there time for one more question? I was wondering about the, the quantum chemistry part you mentioned at the end. So usually in quantum chemistry, you identify a certain set of spin orbitals that are most relevant for the molecule. And then when you write down a Hamiltonian with hopping terms, those hoppings are generally non-local. So I was wondering how you account for that. Oh, because we do it in position. We don't have orbitals. We simulate it in position. So you're, if you want the orbitals are position. Right, so then is it, is, are, you, are you using bare orbitals in a sense then? Are we using what, sorry? You're using bare orbitals, not ones that are optimal. Yeah, right. well, we're using position orbitals. We say delta functions, if you want. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is an overhead because then you need much more orbitals. But this yeah. is why you have a lattice, which has, and we, we computed that with 20 by 20 by 20, for example, lattice size. And you can get some results that resemble very much the, the chemistry. And mm -hmm. if you want to have something precise, you need something like 100 by 100 by 100. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's a way to compactify the lattice if you can use longer. Yeah, but there, there is a problem because then you get something non-local. Exactly right. what you say. And that's the, the surprise that we didn't want to pay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, uh, we're past the noon. Uh, so let's thank Ignacio again for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'll now pass the baton to uh, Yangzi uh, to host.